under the weather today. Um, what are we going to do? We're going to uh, talk over two other possible topics for the research paper um, the next week. We extended that deadline. And um, we're going to look at the uh, quiz results together at the end of class. And in the middle of that, we'll start in on the chapter regarding the internet. Yeah, so if you, if, did you, uh, Sarah, is anyone on? Ron, did you get on this? I don't need you. Oh, okay. So hang on, Tom, let me give it to Ron, and then we'll get up front. Ron, can you just bring it up to the front row once you're done? Thanks. Okay, good. Uh, the other bit of news is uh, if you didn't do the uh, in-class uh, programming, TV programming assignment, you have one more week to get it in. Um, so it can be done uh, at the prompt or if I go through assignments, let's just go here first. So there's a TV programming assignment. It's pretty self-evident. It's worth doing. For those who haven't done it yet, you should do it. Uh, it's points, and uh, it's also uh, um, good good uh, practice for uh, these concepts will come up on the midterm exam too. So that's worth having. Now, I sent out an email, like just an announcement to everybody that if you haven't done it yet, you should do it. That doesn't mean that you personally didn't do it. It's up to you to figure out whether you actually did this thing or not. Uh, but uh, it's like a whole bunch of people have done it, and uh, I gave a grade to those who did it. So those who didn't do it, uh, here's the prompt to find that. Thomas, you don't have access to that, right? I'll give you, a, give you one on paper. For those of you who are wondering, that is the assignment, thank you, that we did in class. Uh, Thomas, yeah, she's right, she's right. That's the one we did in class regarding different programming, uh, TV programming strategies like tent polling, um, Hammocking, leading in, so on and so forth. Yeah, all of those. So uh, that's if you if you remember doing that, then you're good. Otherwise, you should do it. Okay, so we promised to talk about the research paper again, which is probably open. Oh no, it's not open in student view. Let's go back. Research paper. See it in student view. Right. So we talked about two of the two of the uh, possible topics. So you have to pick one topic out of the four that are assigned. And uh, just to remind you that um, the guidelines for these research papers are in a separate link at the bottom because that's what um, was easiest. And uh, both, pa both papers have the same guidelines. So they should be four to six pages in length. In other words, just write four full pages and you're good. If you need to go beyond it, that's great. 12-point uh, font, kind of similar stuff. Um, so regarding references and such, it's called a research paper, so you can't make this up out of your head. You should be using facts, and the best place for the facts, not because it's free of error or anything else, but the textbook is what we're using as our kind of Bible. Um, that probably didn't have a lot of facts in it either, right? However, the textbook is what you should be going for in order to provide facts that support whatever it is you're talking about. If you're quoting material from the textbook, you just need to put the names of the author and the uh, page number. Uh, so like page 34 from Meadoff and K. I'll know that that's the textbook. If you decide to go beyond the textbook because there's other stuff that you want, uh, then give the usual kind of bibliographic reference. Somewhere in here, you'd, you'd want to give, um, we'll use, I'll put a link into APA style uh, for, just so you know how to cite anything else. But uh, it's really very simple to cite other stuff. The main thing though is do cite things that you use and do use uh, factual resources to support what you said. So it's not enough that it was on the PowerPoint or that we said it in class or you heard it. You should have some uh, source for it. And as I said, the textbook is the easiest source to find uh, the material in. There's an index in the back of the textbook. You can look stuff up. So 
You won't do as well if you don't cite the textbook. So do, do get whatever information you can get out of the textbook. Okay, so four pages. Got it. Right, so there's a filter on the assignment prompt which only takes uh, doc, docx, or PDF. So if you're trying to upload pages, it won't take it. Um, and you can always print it out and give it to me in class if you wish. I prefer it online, but uh, if you want to print it or handwrite it, that's okay too. Okay. So uh, this will be uh, acceptable after the due date, but there's a 10% penalty per week, which is the way things usually are. And the due date is uh, February 27th class, so next, next week. Uh, but if you do have to go beyond, you know, get it in within another week and it's not going to be that painful for sure. So uh, big points attached to this uh, so far. Um, <clears throat> this is worth as much as everything we've done so far. Uh, people typically do pretty well on this if they do it. Um, and if they don't do it, you are failing at midterm basically because out of 200 points, this is worth 100. So if you don't do this, it puts you down below uh, the 50% mark, which is well below failing. So you really need to do this. So you might as well <laughs> do it. So uh, this is a prompt for research paper one, which has the, uh, uh, the required topics. So you pick one of these topics and uh, go for it. So in the last couple of, uh, two, two classes ago, we talked about two of the prompts, uh, the ones that were related to radio. Well, this one could have been radio or TV, but we stuck to radio, the radio era. So this is a historical one talking about um, how uh, radio, the coming of radio would have contributed to a national culture. So by national culture, uh, we could define culture pretty loosely, but uh, as uh, shared knowledge amongst people, by knowledge, again, loosely, right? So we could be talking about advertising or entertainment or political broadcasting. But I think the idea here is that prior to, uh, prior to radio, you know, if the original mass medium was the newspaper, those were still pretty local in their reach versus radio became a national communication system, a synchronous national communication system. Everybody listened to radio at the same time and they got the same information from it which is pretty unprecedented that you could tie together people over such a vast area and give them all the same knowledge. At the same time, the same knowledge. Again, knowledge, whether it's advertising, entertainment, political broadcasting, in my definition of national culture here, I'm talking about all of it. So, you know, think about, think about uh, and, and read over the chapter on radio history, especially in the early days of radio in the 1920s and early 30s, because this would have been an enormous change where, um, you know, advertising would have had national brands all of a sudden that could go all over the country. Entertainment would have, you know, entertainers who were known throughout the United States which would have followed on the, you know, it was only 10 years earlier that the movies brought us movie stars, Chaplin, you know, Mary Pickford. Uh, and so uh, and you, you had this, uh, you know, celebrity culture that never existed before. And political broadcasting, again, I recommend that you look in on the fireside chats from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, who was, you know, uh, able to skip the newspapers entirely and have people listen to as his actual voice intimately in their living rooms, you know, as he uh, set forth his political agenda, which was every bit as controversial in its day as it would be now. Uh, you know, many people said the New Deal was unconstitutional. He had, he had enormous resistance. So don't think it was just, you know, a formality. It was, it was a, a hugely important uh, uh, way of reaching people. So, so uh, if you're writing that essay, tackle each of these in a paragraph or two. You know, bookend it by some historical notion of what life might have been like before radio, where you know it was relatively local. Even if you were reading the newspaper, you heard what was happening in Cleveland. There was a national section. You know, if you were in Cleveland, but it wasn't like you got everything firsthand experientially as well. So there's that one. 
Uh, and then we talked about this one, which is more about radio the survivor. You know, uh, discuss the factors that have allowed radio to survive in a telecommunications landscape driven by visual media, proliferation of mobile devices. So there, you know, you're, you're looking at basically how has radio adapted in its programming content over the years. We saw that uh, when television appeared, it cannibalized the, the, uh, the, the radio networks, took their talent, took their most popular shows, uh, and left radio within 10 years, you know, uh, adrift without, without a purpose, without an objective, and radio turned to music. Uh, and uh, last week we talked about how that developed out into the various formats we have now. And now, so this invites you to think about how radio survived then and now how radio is going to cope with the competition from online streaming music services, which are uh, going to be a, 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 the next, you know, the next hurdle and uh, uh, you know mobile devices I think mobility has been a key to radio survival so you want to think about whether um, now that we all have a <coughs> mobile source of streaming music whether radio can continue you know to hang on based on it being the source of music that you could carry with you everywhere because that obviously is no longer the case within the last five years we're talking about, right? That's what that one is up to. So we talked about those, and now there's a couple of them which are related to television. So let's uh, first look at, the, well, which one is most, uh, yeah, let's look, check this one out. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, this is a, a kind of a, 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 I hope one of these will be fun to you, I don't know. This one, compare prime time schedules from different eras. For example, 55 to 75, 95, 65, 85, 2005. So in other words, you're comparing one, two, three different time periods, okay? Break out the program types. So in other words, think about what kinds of programs were there at the time, uh, you know, uh, you know, if we were looking at, if we were going to go 2005 or something, you know, you'd want to acknowledge the experience, the appearance of reality TV, for instance, at that time versus 1985 versus 1965. You know, 85, what might have been good? And you can look all, you know, in your textbook has plenty of, of, of breakdown about this. But what I could, could say, okay, the prime time, so like Dallas, for instance. That would be, you know, really emblematic. 1965, was there something like uh, the Mod Squad? That's probably a tiny bit too early for that. Or then prior to that, you would get things like Gunsmoke or whatever. So uh, I picked that one for another reason, okay. So, draw conclusions about the type of world that was reflected in television's mirror from each era. Ratings for various time periods can be found at TV Ratings Index. What you want to do is, okay, I'm going to do this, let's say, and I picked 1965, so click through to 65 and see what's on. It's old stuff. Bonanza, Gomer Pyle, The Lucy Show, The Red Skelton Show, Batman. Anyone seen the original Batman? Yeah, that has a real kitschy class to it. That's, that's, that's worth seeing still. Um, uh, Andy Griffith, Bewitched, Beverly Hillbillies. Okay, so it's all, uh, it's all stuff that I would have put with my arrow up there. Let's just cheat a little bit. Let's look at 1968, the year of the Democratic Convention. <laughs> Okay. 68, 69. Laugh in. Um, you can check out a couple of those um, uh, on YouTube. That might be interesting. Family Affair, Dean Martin, Beverly Hillbillies. We're still in sitcom world. Let's cheat a little more. Let's see what happens in 69. Looks pretty much like 68. <laughs> Let's try 70. Flip Wilson. We got the Mod Squad down here. Got Laughing, Mary Tyler Moore. Okay, we still got Marcus Welby on top. Well, thinking, thinking through. Okay, let's let's try maybe the 80s as well. Dukes of Hazard. 
60 minutes, was rating high, third highest. Incredible. Hmm. Archie Bunker's place. So, different kind of world. Let's look at 85. Cosby Show, 60 minutes still. Golden Girls. Okay, I think you may want, you may want to uh, pick around for your, oh, Miami Vice, the original, right? And Dallas, Dallas, I figured that would be sort of mid 80s. Um, okay, let's go back to the prompt to explain this a little more, but we do have a little bit of data there. All right, so the idea, first of all, is pick your dates. Uh, maybe I would go, maybe it would be great to catch the early 70s in here. So, I mean, you can pick your eras, right? Uh, maybe 55, 75, 95 would actually be good. Yeah, maybe I'd pick that. So break out the program types, draw conclusions about the type of world that was reflected in television's mirror from each era. Ratings for various time periods can be found there. Okay. So really just use the ratings in order to find out what shows were actually on the air when, you, um, when, when you're looking at your uh, time period. However, uh, the idea here is to try to uh, connect television with what's going on uh, in the actual uh, time period. So let's just go for the 1960s if we said that, okay. So each decade is going to have um, all about the current events that are happening. And it's also even going to have something about television as well talking about the most prominent shows. Um, <clears throat> so what you're trying to do is connect, connect the sort of social history that's going on at that time with what you see on television. Um, so, you know, in the 60s, which is a period when the country is, you know, liberalizing, it's the civil rights era, there's, there's a, um, a good deal of, of social change happening. You can find those old shows like Gunsmoke, which are basically westerns, which could have been made in, you know, the 40s, the 50s or anything. But you'll see new shows that, uh, that have a more, uh, more of an interest in diversity, more of a, more, more uh, younger characters and social themes in them, you know. So, if you're looking in the 60s, in, well, we, we found it actually in the, it was 1970, actually, with the Mod Squad. So I think what's interesting is just to see how does television reflect, if at all, the social changes that are going on at the time. And I think you can find reflected in, in a show like the Mod, Shaw, Mod, Mod Squad, which is basically a cop show with... Uh, uh, a young black detective, a white, a white girl, and a white guy. So it was kind of a trio um, of, of investigators. It was you know, young people, diverse cast, uh, social issues as well. This is the period also where you'll find things like All in the Family and all of the, um, uh, <clears throat> the Norman Lear situation comedies, which were all socially committed, you know, the Archie Bunker was a sort of a right-wing bigot in there. So, uh, you know, working class guy who was challenged by his, you know, family life with his hippie son-in-law son and stuff. So basically what you're looking at is you're, you're just thinking about the social history that's happening in each era and then trying to connect it to TV, you know. Um, Dallas, an enormously popular, kind of basically a prime time but an hour-long soap opera about, you know, the miseries of super rich people uh, coming up, you know, in the mid-1980s in the Reagan era where, you know, there was just a lot of, a lot of deregulation, a lot of, a lot of uh, money and such <laughs> flying around, conspicuous consumption. Uh, 2005, you know, looking at maybe reality TV as... as uh, um, <clears throat> sort of, you know, again, connecting out to uh, that tendency in programming, which was uh, there's tons and tons of channels on TV. You got to put something on them. Reality TV turns out to be extremely popular and also, you know, very, uh, uh, very cheap to make. And it seems to really catch on with audiences who, you know, want to feel like they too could become, you know, a part of this media world that, you know, they're not so far away from becoming the next 
kind of reality TV celebrity type of thing. So uh, I'm not sure exactly how that connects to uh, the, uh, the social life of the 2000s, but I think you might be able to connect it. Let's see if that even, the decade, 2000s, yes. Decades of the 2000s. <coughs> So a similar thing in Wikipedia, and it's perfectly okay to cite Wikipedia for this. Uh, you know, wow, politics and wars. Well, perhaps you know, there were a whole bunch of shows that after you know 9/11, Homeland is still on the air. It's still managing to survive. About you know, uh, protecting protecting us from terrorism and such. Uh, you could also talk about the rise of. Uh, Arab Muslim stereotypes after uh, that kind of thing and, and you know the kinds of shows that you'll see so I'm thinking 24 I'm thinking homeland I'm thinking you know uh, how they reflect a new kind of paranoia about those um, people after 9/11 um, and so on and so forth so as you, you know the, the the game is you'll do well on this if you manage to connect just what's going on in society with some kind of trend that's on TV. And uh, to get, you know, uh, if, if you're not too familiar about what America was like in the 1970s or the 1980s or something, Wikipedia is, as you can see, is exhaustively there to let you know about what happened. You know? And uh, so you could come at it from both sides. You could, you could look at like, what was on TV. Uh, and you could also look at, uh, you know, what, what the social history is. And of course, if you are, you know, not too familiar about what these shows are, you can look those up on Wikipedia too. So there, and there would be a bit about each of those, most of those shows in, in the textbook. A little bit. Uh, but Murder, She Wrote, for instance, they won't mention that. Cosby Show, they'll mention that because, you know, groundbreaking, you know, incredibly popular show with a middle class African American cast, um, you know, and uh, despite all that's gone on around Cosby and, and all the controversies, you know, uh, in terms of television history, that was a hugely influential show. Current shows like Blackish still, you know, nod to, uh, to Cosby and, and that, you know, whole idea that, yeah, you could show a, an upscale African-American family um, as a, and, and structure a whole show around it. So any questions about this one? You may be scared off because there's a certain amount of like, you know, look at that gigantic Wikipedia page, look at that, all of these show names. But literally, I think you'd only need one or two specific shows and some kind of trend that you wanted to uh, discuss. And there are no rights and wrongs on, on that one. You know, I mean, it's uh, you're pretty much arguing your case as to how how uh, that one. Where's my research paper thing? Yeah, uh, you're pretty much arguing your case. Here it is about you know just saying, well, look, look at this time period. There was a war going on. Look at you know how that appears on TV. Okay, cool. No questions on that one? Then this one, the first one, Fox, UPN, and the WB, uh, which became the CW, uh, employed certain programming strategies to compete with the big three networks. Discuss the strategy used at one of these stations you pick, or uh, the UCW, and you might as well go for the UCW if you want. You'll find more written about it. And whether you believe it is successful, and what sort of impact, positive or negative, the strategy had on bro broadcast programming overall. Okay, cool. So we kind of left out. Anyway, let's let's see what we can find here again, right? W network. So that'll tell you about the origins of the network and also, you know, all kinds of business uh, comings up in it. But let's just see. That would give you the history anyway. See. Okay, cool. So um, 
you get a little bit of historical background looking at it that way. Again, I'm focusing on CW because there's going to, like, you can pull it up just right away really easily. But um, so as you can see, they're programming Tuesday night, um, two hours of programming. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday goes the whole way. Special. Okay. Nothing on Saturday, Sunday. Is that your... Uh, is that your experience of the CW in terms of prime time? What do they show on Saturday and Sunday? No ideas? I don't watch, so I don't know. I think it's a bunch of infomercials. Really? The last time I watched the CW, it could have been like two, three years ago. Infomercials past like 9 o'clock. Uh, okay. I don't know if it's still the same. Yeah. Times, uh, they went to air like old rerun of um, comedies that used to be up on different stations. Gotcha. Okay. And let's just see what, what's our local affiliate here. Oh, yeah. Let's so, Ion. Local program, 6 to 12. Okay. So, we can quickly confirm then that. Uh, uh, the CW programming strategy is broad broadcast original shows in prime time only Monday through Friday. Uh, and then you could also look through and you'll be much more familiar with these types of shows than you would with, you know, what's going on TV in the 1960s. So what would you, you know, how would you characterize what they show? Who's the target audience, and uh, what types of shows do they use to, to reach them? Target audience, you, you know, we talked about demographics. How old do you think the target audience is? Old or young? Who's watching The Flash? Young. Young, yeah, I'd say so. My 11-year-old child watches The Flash, and he loves it. <laughs> How young should it be? Not to let's say, you know, I don't know. I would definitely say uh, probably oh, 25 and under. Does that make sense? Black Lightning? I don't know. Riverdale? So up to late teens? OK. So we could say this is just a guess. And you could probably confirm it on. Uh, the, uh, on the Wikipedia, but just looking at looking at the uh, uh, looking at the website, target audience is young. That's one good point. Second good point: Monday to Friday, no weekend. Okay. Um, so that's also, so these are two programming strategies. Uh, and let's talk just in terms of, and you guys could use this and just build on this if you want. But this also uh, goes for Fox as well. And basically, I didn't want to pick Fox because I know that already, but CW, I've never really looked into. But remember the CW was a merger of two smaller networks that really couldn't make a go of it themselves. And so they merged and uh, um, they, uh, they've done better, especially now with these kind of DC uh, comic shows. Um, so there's, that's one type of programming they're doing. Riverdale, you know, so sort of, uh, um, uh, again, you know, soaps for young people, but uh, beyond that, a little bit, I guess. So this would have held for Fox at the same time. The first thing is go younger than the other networks. Because, for instance, CBS, their, their target is like 50-year-old people. No joke. Like, if you look at who looks at, you know, um, SCU, uh, who looks at, uh, uh, you know, their, their procedural shows, which they're really big on. They're older than 50-year-old people. The sitcoms are slightly younger. But, you know, CBS, the median age of their audience is in their 50s, for sure. And ABC and NBC, not too far behind. So Fox, you know, if you think about it, what, what did Fox start programming with? The Simpsons and stuff like that. So they definitely went uh, younger. 
And so CW, you can see they're going younger as well, for sure. Um, these are shows which are kind of high engagement with young audiences. You could ask yourself, do they, what's, take a look at their social media too, if you want. Are you interested in that? So, you know, what kinds of things do they do in their shows or on their website or with their promotions that are also appealing to, you know, to get kids more engaged with, um, with tweeting while the show is on or with sharing, uh, you know, that's probably another thing that I'm pretty sure they do. But this other thing, this is also out of the Fox playbook. Uh, stay away from the weekend because the weekend is typically um, uh, poorly rated. Like the, the big three networks, um, you know, they've had success on Sunday nights with CBS's 60 Minutes for a long, long time. So they'll use, they'll do things like, you know, they'll, they'll program news, current affairs, documentary. They might put a movie on or something. Uh, but they won't put on, you know, their primetime sitcoms or anything which is really highly competitive. Fox carved out, you know, their Sunday um, Sunday evening successfully by putting on blocks of animation, right? Which are still kind of famous for Fox on Sunday night. You pretty much know you're going to get that. Um, so, but Fox didn't do that. If, if you read the history of Fox, they started out like with limited hours and Fox still only has a two hour prime time versus CBS and NBC and ABC, which has a three hour prime time. So, uh, Let's put that in there as well. Monday to Friday, no weekend, and two hours programming. Not three. So, and they, you know, they go from eight to 10. And then at 10 o'clock, the CW affiliate will have their news. And that's what Fox has always done too. Fox's news, their evening news comes on an hour early because um, they wanted to give their affiliates that possibility. So those are, you know, those are three very important programming strategies. And really, for an essay this size, that's all you need, three, three programming strategies. Um, and of course, we were talking about the CW. Go ahead if you want to write this one about the CW or if you want to write about Fox or UPN. Uh, what we're just looking at is you know, one, of the, one of the smaller networks, although Fox has now built itself into a, you know, a, a competitor for sure. So, uh, so that's what you'd be doing. You'd say, say okay, I three, see these three programming strategies um, and, uh, and then talk about how they differ, how that makes them, you know, the CW different from CBS, NBC, or ABC, basically. So whether you believe it is successful, what sort of impact, positive or negative, the strategy has had on broadcast programming overall so uh, uh, you know the kinds of shows that you see up there on on those um, on those uh, networks you know what do, what do you think about how um, you know how the, how the rest of the industry or the rest of the networks may respond around that type of content you know do you see CBS trying to make any shows for young people? Uh, or, you know, what are, what are the other uh, uh, impacts that, that those types of shows may have? And the CW has definitely done really well with those shows, even though it's, it's tough to do what they do. Okay, so uh, th that's a good start uh, on that one. And uh, so there's some ideas on here that you're welcome to follow up on. Uh, any questions or any, who's, who's planning on working on what? Just... Uh, out of interest, say. Yeah, Dylan? I'm going to do the radio becomes relative and like popular. Rel okay, so Rel what radio survivor? That's what yeah. I always think of. Like, how did it survive? Cool. That's great, especially given your interest or, mm -hmm. you know, like in the radio industry. I don't, like, where, like, because I don't have the book, like, what chapters would be best to look in for that one? Uh, chapter four on radio programming, okay. for sure. And then chapter one, uh, is it one? I guess it's two. Because one is like the overview. So chapter two would be like the, the history of radio. Okay. So, you know, look especially at that critical period of the, you know, late 1940s and early 50s on the history chapter because that's when uh, radio loses, you know, all the variety shows, all the other shows go over to television. Perfect. Yeah. 
and then chapter four to talk, think about, you know, all the current events. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Other ideas? Things people are looking at? Anyone thinking of doing the national culture one? Yeah, Sarah? Okay. Any ideas about it? There's, there's, it just seems, seems interesting. <laughs> it seems interesting because, because I'm not from here, it's a little difficult for me to do something like yeah. very historical because still right now I don't watch TV yes. specifically. So even knowing the content, I mean, I could do that in, for Italian things, but I don't think it's interesting for you. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, because I know, I mean, it's something about your culture. And because this is not my culture and I still don't watch TV, I don't really feel to criticize something that I don't really know. Yeah, I got you. you know? Yeah, yeah. So that one is interesting because I can discover even. Yeah, that, that one is. Yeah. It, it, it's exactly vision. exactly you know and that that type of cultural transformation would be universal in, yeah, in any in, in any country where you know electronic media takes hold yeah versus you know the one we were just discussing it as I was talking about it I was thinking you know has anybody ever heard of these shows before and how much of an effort that you guys would have to make in order to find out about you know some of these shows and you know, yeah, since they're absolutely foreign to to you, then it'd be like every single show you'd have to look up. Versus Thomas and I probably watched a lot of them yeah, when sure. they were in reruns, at least. You yeah, know, sure. so so that's that that makes that one easier, more comfortable to, to draw those connections. Yeah. Any others? Any anybody working on uh, the the CW one, the one we just talked about? Ron, yeah. Are you thinking of the CW or? Yeah. Yeah. I guess like when so yeah, my uh, your tour is like when Earth Today is part of being. I mean, you said yours like be a feed network, so I'm wondering. Um, I already know it's like there's no way anyone uh, anyone network would actually want to just stay in the same lane unless they don't want to lose their footing. But if you want to just grow bigger as a uh, as a broadcasting company and I could at least be about uh, XSP, uh, the big one of the big four even. Like what is it? What is your overall future aspiration? Uh huh. Uh, or is the overall broadcast? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think the, what it's a, it's really a game of survival, you know. And CW has uh, they've gone from scraping by to doing pretty well, you know, in their current strategy. And, and um, yeah, I I think it's it's they've they've been very successful within the you know within the reduced expectations that they have and that, you know, a lot of their shows are rated, you know, two and a half, three, um, which would probably get them canceled on a CBS or an NBC, you know, which are looking for like sevens and eights. But, but given the expectation is lower for the CW, and given that they have a great target on young people that those other networks can't get, that you know that's enough to to be. You know, I think anyone would consider it a success. Just think of it in terms of a media buyer. You want to reach young people. You, you know you can spend a fortune going to the Big Bang Theory, which would you know it probably has equal numbers of young people. And it's got a ton of old people, but you'd be throwing away so much money, re you know, with all those old people who are watching CBS versus you can get cheaper, better targeting from the CW. And maybe you don't have such a giant audience, but but they're they're the people you want to reach, you know, if you have a product for for young people. So that's that's how they can really do well. And then they keep the cost under control by only you know, only competing in prime time. So they don't they don't try to compete over the weekend because that rate's even lower and the kinds of shows that work on the weekend, you know, current affairs and that kind of thing, it's it's like their audience of young people are out, you know, having fun. They're not sitting at home watching sixty minutes. You know, so so it makes a lot of sense what they're doing. And uh, and, and it's being you know, again, they're not they won't rival the big four. But they will. They have their niche, and they're doing well in their niche now with these, you know, with Riverdale and with the the Flash and those types of shows. 
you know, another thing is that, that they're they're creating content which goes on Netflix or Hulu afterwards, and therefore that keeps making money for them for a long, long time. So that's that's important too. Yeah, so that's a good topic. You got a good angle on it too. And are we are we missing any? Oh, so this historical compare prime time schedules. Thomas, are you thinking of doing that one? No, I'm just more thinking about the, the launch block 1970. Yeah, that's so. That's this one where you compare sort of three different eras. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That would be interesting, given given that you know most of the shows. From yeah, I remember. Yeah. I was just watching it on PBS uh, just a couple of days ago. You know, the, uh, the Archie Bunker and all uh -huh. the stuff. You know, they had an interview with, uh, I think it's Norman Lear. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, I, he was, they were going back to some of the topics that he discussed. Because back in those days, you know, it was a whole different scene. You know, uh, to bring up abortion was like a controversial thing, you know? Yeah. With the Roe v. Wade and all that. Even you know? even the birth control pill was, yeah. like, if you made a joke about that, it was Right, like, and then there. also the racial part, the black versus, you know, and white uh, thing was, was you remember? Because uh, Archie Bunker was the first one on TV to, to kiss another black man, mm -hmm. you know, and they showed that, you know, so it was, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. And you know, Norman Lear's still alive, I guess you saw Is him. Is he really? Yeah, he's still, he published a memoir and he's in his 90s. And, uh, and he's uh, um, an executive producer on a Netflix show. It's the reboot of One Day at a Time, which he oh, put, yeah. put back together uh, with a new kind of, a new cast. Uh -huh. Yeah. So oh. he's still really active. Yeah. yeah. Okay, he's got to be up there. He's heavy in his 90s. He is in his 90s, yeah. 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 Wow. So uh, well, there you go. Okay. Anybody else? No questions about this? So get on it. <laughs> we extended it a week, which was really necessary given how I'd scheduled everything for sure. So, uh, so now you're close to having heard you know, a bunch of suggestions and stuff. Just jump in there.